Hey, welcome to The Perspective. I'm Mike Sherbino. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had that experience where you've been talking to a friend and say, hey, we got to connect again really soon? Or maybe it's a, a voice from the past and you get a text message like I often get on my phone and you say, hey, when can we connect? The word connect is an interesting uh, word because it carries so many various meanings. Sometimes if I say, hey, yeah, we should connect sometime, it could carry the idea that I don't really want to talk to you maybe in two or three months when it's convenient. It's a, if it's a young man writing to a woman who he's very interested in, it could mean the past, you know, I hope you get back to me. Hey, can we connect over a coffee? I want to, I want to talk to you. Uh, if it's a, a business deal, you want to connect with them and, and get the information going back and forth. In many ways, when we read God's word, it's almost as if he is sending us a text message saying, I would like to connect with you. But the problem for most of us, we have a busy schedule. Life is just filled with so many things that we think are important. And what we really need to do is probably just put down our phone and, uh, and pause and say, God, I want to hear from you. But hearing from God is a challenge, especially if we're not used to connecting with him. Uh, hearing from God is uh, an even bigger challenge if we don't know how to connect. So here to do part two, uh, with me again is my brother, David. Yesterday, we were talking about the essentials of our faith. Today, we're talking about how, in particular as men, we can connect with God. But of course, it's for all of us. And David, uh, welcome back to the program. Glad you're with us. Um, Thank you. The whole thing of connecting is sometimes a daunting thought, especially for men. Well, it's interesting that you brought up the phone as an illustration. I just read an email today that said something to the effect that more people are diligent in checking their emails and connecting with trivia than they are in being connecting with God. And I think that's probably true. Sometimes you get up in the, in the morning and what do you do? The first thing you do is you, you jump on this device and you see what's, what's on the agenda for today, or you start to get into Facebook or Twitter or messenger or whatever the platform happens to be. And I think that for many of us, um, this has to become a different way of life. And so you mentioned also, we often are so busy, do we really have the time? And I'm going to suggest this. You'll never find the time. You just simply have to make time. And so one of the things that I have found to be very helpful is to develop what we might call a rhythm or a pattern of life. And maybe one of the things that you will do is decide, I need to carve out some specific period of time whereby I will be focused not on all the other demands of my life and what's taking place in the business world or my social world or my educational world today, but I'm going to take some time just to be alone with God. You know, David, and, I'm going to jump in for a second because as you were talking about connecting and the whole thing about our phone, you know, we're always looking at our phone or our devices I use the phone for that illustration right now. And as soon as you started to talk, I could feel the vibration that somebody was calling me. And I'm gonna tell you, even though I'm recording, recording a show, it was a big temptation not to look to see who was calling me. And because we always wanna give in to the tyranny of the urgent. You've written a book called Reconnect, and we're gonna make this available to the first 20 people that write in today. And uh, tell us about the book and then carry on with what you're saying about having this intimate connection with God. So if you'd like a copy of David's book, write to us prayer at the perspective.tv and request a copy and we'll send it to you. But what's I know this book is about what we're talking about. So carry on, dude. Well, because it's so hard for us to develop practices and sometimes we think I've got to spend some time with God and there's a what we call the one minute devotional Bible where you have one minute and people do go through it. And all that does is relieve you of a little bit of guilt, but it's not transformational. It's not changing. So the basis of this book is looking at ancient spiritual practices that have been part of the people of God for thousands of years, but put into a more contemporary context. And so I begin the very first one is just learning to be silent and to be still. I mean, when they, I don't know who measures this stuff, but someone said the average person carries on 1,200 conversations a day in their head. Well, there's just a lot of noise in our head. And so we begin by just becoming very silent and quiet. And I'd suggest maybe starting out 
with five minutes. That's all. Five minutes. Now, you've ever been to a rem uh, remember say service and they have the minute of silence. I've seen people checking their watch to see when is this over. We're not They're going squirrely. Having yeah. A minute of silence. They're and then so I look antsy. at different prayer formats and then different ways of reading the scripture, particularly one way, which is not just giving you information, but it's trying to take the scriptures so that it can be formed in you. So it's for formation, not just information. And this ancient reading is called holy reading. And I, in the book, I explain the basic steps you can take, and I give you passages you can read one a day over a period of an entire week, just to give you an idea of how it actually begins to work. So let me ask this question, David. Uh, when you talk to me, I agree, I, I hear that, and I know how important that is in my own journey. Uh, it hasn't always been easy. But as people are listening right now, maybe they're thinking, why on earth should I ever do this? Uh, I, I, the way I'm living right now, it seems to be okay until we hit that proverbial brick wall. Um, I kind of think that not taking time to connect with God is like having a steady diet of chips and pop. Eventually, it's going to catch up to you and it's going to be, it'll destroy you. What are the warning signs that we're not spending time with God and that we desperately need to reconnect? Well, I think it becomes a way of life. And it's not just saying I'm going to do a half hour devotional. It's integrating God into all aspects of everyday life. Uh, one of the things that I love from the Reformation is the idea that all of life is sacred. So whether you're working on the job, let's say you're in construction or teaching in a classroom in school or working in a hospital or serving tables in a restaurant, do you do this to the glory of God? Because it's all spiritual life. So the question is, how do I incorporate God into the ordinariness of my everyday living? And to me, that, that's why it's so important. Otherwise, you just keep doing stuff. And what's the point and what's the purpose? Is it to gain more money? Is it to have a large portfolio? Is it to boost your ego? At the end of the day, you get there and you think, is this all that there is? I mean, the smartest man who's ever supposed to have lived was Solomon. And he wrote a book with all kinds of proverbs. And he said, I have tried all these things. I've had everything. And then he has this final statement. He said, it's like chasing after the wind. How do you capture it? And so I think God has created us to be in a relationship with him. And he wants to live out that relationship in the ordinariness of everyday life. So why not find out how we are designed and built and start to live that to the full? Otherwise, we're going to try this. We're going to try that. We're going to try the other. And ultimately, people will find out it's not that satisfying. So before we go to the break, we've got about a minute and a half here, David. Just talk to us that five minutes of day as a starting point. What are some of the things that you do in that five minutes? Walk us through that for a, a minute or so. Well, one of the things that I do is that right now I am following this little book. And it's written by a friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Phil Reinders. It's called Seeking God's Face. And it's good for one whole year. And it begins with an opening psalm. There's a reading of scripture, and then I focus on reading the scripture again, and I think about the main idea that comes to me. And then there's an opportunity to offer a prayer. And sometimes I write the prayer out. I'll talk more about writing prayers later on. Uh, and then there is a prayer that he has written, which I find very helpful. And so that becomes a way that I start my day. Now, you can do it in five minutes. I take a bit longer. And I do a few other exercises with it. But that's a simple way of beginning the day. And I go back because in the reading of that passage, there's a thought or an idea that has come out in my mind. And I want to try to keep that in the forefront of my day. Perfect. We're going to jump in right there, folks. You're watching The Perspective. I'm Mike Sherbin. I'm here with David Sherbin on today as we're talking about reconnecting with God. And you're welcome to write to us, prayer at theperspective.tv. We'd love to pray for you. If you'd like to talk to somebody, you can call 855-910-6297. We have people on standby waiting to pray with you and to help you connect with God. Stay with us. We're going to be right back. 
And I had a person tell me when I was 11 years old, it was a little morbid at the time, but I didn't really figure it out until I was a little older, but he said, grab a piece of paper and write down what you would want on your headstones. What do you want to be remembered as? And write that out and then think about how you can spend more days living as that person. That will give you the clarity. And then when you do the clarity, then you build in steps of what you need to do each day to become that person. And then you determine how you want to impact culture or those around you. How do I live as that person to have that impact? And then do you want to, what do you want to leave behind? Maybe it's the people, maybe it's a foundation. What do you want to leave behind? Because this is not a dress rehearsal. Th this life will kill you. <laughs> We're all all in. And at the same time, there's beauty in that. How do we recognize that and structure our lives knowing that we have a limited amount of time and we can't afford to waste it? We're here with Dr. Dave Sherbino, and we're talking about reconnecting with God. How do we build a relationship with him? What are some of the warning signs if our relationship is deteriorated? And again, I just want to invite you to get a copy of David's book. It's called Reconnect. And uh, if you want to write into us at The Perspective, we're going to give a free copy to the first 20 people who write in. Reconnect, interesting thing. And David, I want to read a, a question to you. And I've got my phone here just in case somebody does call me. And if I feel it's urgent, we'll just stop the recording of this show and I'll take it, okay? There you go. Here we go. Why are so many Christians pursuing aspects of life that do not bring ultimate satisfaction? And uh, let's pick on the guys first off. You know, everything from our hobbies, our sports, to our desire to make more money. I don't know. Why are we pursuing all those things? Well, I think the first thing we need to realize is that we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a culture, and we are inundated constantly by all kinds of messages every single day that says, this will make your life fulfilled. And so it could be a product that you need to buy, the type of car you ought to be driving, the type of house you want to live in. Uh, the list can go on and on. And I am as much a victim of that as anybody else. And so one of the questions we have to begin to start asking ourselves is this, is this message true? Uh, I talked to a dad who, when the advertisement comes on in their television and their kids are there, he will shout out, is that true? Is that really true? It's kind of funny. But, but people have bought into that and we think this is going to be the sign of my success. So here's the question that people often ask. The first question they ask when they meet you is this. So what's your name? And you tell them. Then the second question they ask is this. What do you do? And that has given to us the essence of our identity. And so what happens when you're no longer doing or when you've no longer accumulated all these things? Have you lost your identity? And sometimes in our scale of things, we think if I have A, B, C, and D, then I'm going to be a person of importance. For example, I might need to have a certain financial portfolio. I might need to live in a specific neighborhood. Being able to travel and vacation, have academic degrees after my name. And this is going to give me my identity. I love the story of Henry Nowen, who taught at Harvard, Yale, and Notre Dame. Written numerous books, and yet he found himself really empty. And he had been following a mantra, which was this. Work hard, get ahead. And that's what a lot of people do. He was invited to Richmond Hill to be the pastor of 40 mentally challenged adults in a program called Daybreak. And he went there and he decided to follow another mantra, which is love Jesus with all your heart. And that was the transforming change of his life. So I think, I think this. My identity is not having A, B, C, and D. My identity is knowing that I am the beloved daughter or son of God. Now, if I'm the beloved, 
how do I develop that relationship of the one who has loved me? And that's why the spiritual practices become so important because it helps us to deal with all of the false messages that culture is giving to us that says, you need this. This is going to give you the essence of life. You know, David, you, uh, like myself, have been with people uh, as they've taken their final breath. I was with somebody just uh, two nights ago, just before they uh, shut down all the life support systems, and I was with the family, and, and the lady was quite lucid. And uh, we actually prayed together, and we sang about God's amazing grace. Uh, yeah. It's very interesting that, you know, they weren't bringing in a U-Haul to pick up all the possessions. I think you were with somebody just uh, a week or two ago, and as you prayed with them, they took their final breath. And I don't know about you, but on, when I was driving back from the hospital after that encounter this week, and I've been there several times uh, in similar situations, it made me ponder, what am I doing and what is really important? And, and it was hard because I had to take a breath because I wanted to jump back into the hurry, the hurry up mentality that we have. But I paused and said, what is it that I'm chasing? Um, what are people chasing right now? Well, you know, I learned this some time ago, um, that learning to practice silence and solitude is really important because it helps me to become much more aware of the presence of God in life. Now, the thing is, a lot of us know theologically or biblically the promise that Jesus said, I am with you always. So do I just know this in my head or is it a lived out experience? And so what this writer had said was, as you learn to practice God's presence in your life, it will be so different at the time of your dying. And as I've been with people who are dying, uh, I've often wondered this question, so what is it like? So when we had a family member die, and I was with that family member, and we prayed with that person, we, uh, we talked to them, we you know, blessed them, and at the end... I read the 23rd Psalm, and I got to these words. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not be afraid because you are with me. And at that moment, the monitors just went flat. Wow. Now, this person was loved, was prayed for, we were present, but he still had to die alone. That's the reality for all of us. But you see, when you know the presence of God in daily living, Death isn't so scary because, you know, you're going to take one step from this stage of eternal life into the full presence of Almighty God. And he is with us on the journey. So that's why I think we need to be discovering the reality of God in life um, so that we can live this life to the full. Jesus said, I've come that you have a life abundant. You know, the fullness of life is walking with him day by day. It's not about having two cars in the driveway, a television in every bedroom, you know, whatever it's going to be. The fullness of life is living life to the full and enjoying it and knowing that God's there. And when it comes to that stage that we have to step over the threshold into the fullness of eternity, that's not going to be so scary. We have one minute left. Take us back and just to review some of the things that help us to find a healthy rhythm. Maybe there's three or four. So one of the things that I would suggest is this. Try to begin your day by taking a passage of scripture, not a long passage, and just reading it briefly and ask this question. Is there a word or phrase that comes to my mind? And then read it again and then ask, how does it apply to my life? And then read it again and say, God, what do you want me to do with it? And make that part of your prayer for the day. At the end of the day, I often use what is called the prayer of examine. Now, this is in the book. And the prayer of examine helps me to review my day. And I ask three questions. What am I thankful for in this day? Where have I noticed God in my life today? And the third one is, is there anything I need to confess to God in this day? Now, I don't tend to navel gaze, but I let God bring it to my conscious awareness. And then the fourth question is, what am I resolving to do differently tomorrow? Love that. David, I want to thank you for being on the program. I want to encourage you to write in and get a copy of Reconnect. 
We'll send a free copy to the first 20 people today. And those thoughts that David shared, you'll find them in the book as we want to encourage you in this journey with God to make space for God. We come to the final part in the story of Ruth. And the whole series has been called Messy Lives because if things could have got messed up, to, uh, you know, tossed, topsy turvy, this was the story. This is where it happens. And now we come to chapter four of the book of Ruth. And let me explain a little bit of the background. One of the principles, as I shared yesterday, is that God had allowed uh, a social uh, system that would protect widows. And what it meant is that the next of kin had to uh, not only take the widow into uh, his home and marry her, but then he would also get all the land uh, from the deceased person. So in this situation, when we're coming to it, it sounds pretty exciting. You know, Elimelech had been a man of great prestige. He died in the country of Moab, shouldn't have been down there, but his land was still there in Israel. And now Naomi is looking for someone to take care of her and Ruth. And the man Boaz that we've been inter introduced to, he is willing to be the kinsman redeemer. That was the phrase given, the kinsman redeemer. Beautiful statement. But he says, there's someone who is closer than me. And he said, if he will not redeem you, then I will. And so we come to chapter four and it says, Boaz went to the gate and sat down there with the leaders of the town. And uh, he said to the man who was the closer redeemer, he said, turn aside, friends, sit down here. And he turned and sat down and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And they sat down. And then he said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought of you. And uh, to tell you, bide in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. And he said, yeah, this sounds like a great deal. I'd love that land. And then he puts in this slider. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. And then the kinsman redeemer said this, I can't redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance. He said to Boaz, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. In the few minutes that we have, I just want to unpack some of the principles that I believe will encourage you so much today. Remember yesterday we talked about how we need to resist the urge to panic when we're in a difficult situation. But here is the reality. When your back is up against the wall, you need to know the capabilities of the one who has promised to help you. The first kinsman redeemer thought, yeah, I'll buy the land, that's all good. But he did not want to take care of Ruth. He did not want to marry her and raise up kids. And he certainly didn't want an extra mother-in-law. That's just the harsh reality. But Boaz, he had been prepared for this. He was, he was willing and able and you see, the first kinsman redeemer had good intentions, but not the right qualifications. He didn't have enough resources. The second kinsman redeemer had both the desire and ability to redeem Ruth and Naomi, even though Naomi was an outcast. Did you know this? Boaz's mother was Rahab the prostitute. His father had married uh, the woman who had helped the spies. Uh, escape from the city of Jericho. He knew what it was like to grow up with someone who was looked down on and despised. And so he had a tender heart already. Who could have scripted all of that except the Lord himself? Boaz had not only the ability financially, but he had the heart and he fell in love with Ruth. It's a beautiful story. 
You see, the kinsman redeemer is a picture of what Jesus Christ has done for all mankind. No one was able to pay the price for my sin and yours, but we read in the book of Ephesians, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, which he's lavished on us. And Paul wrote that God demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us so that he could redeem us. And folks, when your back is up against the wall, let go and hold, let God hold on to you. Let go of your pride trying to think I can do it on my own because the Bible says pride goes before destruction and hold on to God's promises for you where he says, my God will meet all your need according to his riches in Christ because he is an amazing kinsman redeemer. Give your mess to the master for he gives grace for the place so that you and I can walk our talk and experience God's best for the rest of our lives. Sometimes we're guilty of trying to play the angles. I don't want to play the angles with you today. I'm not going to try to bribe you. But I do know this, that if you have listened to what we've talked about today and start to implement some healthy spiritual principles into your life, some rhythms, things that the way you start the day, the way you end the day, it's going to transform your personal life. It's going to impact your marriage, if you're married, your relationship with kids, and the list goes on and on even the way that you treat your coworkers. I wanna invite you to get a copy of Reconnect. You can write to us at theperspective.tv, so easy, and we'll send a free copy to the first 20 people that write in today, just to encourage you in this journey of reconnecting with God. And can I say this, that if you're not sure you've ever started your relationship with Jesus, I want you to know that he loves you, that he cares for you. And he's saying, listen, I wanna carry your pressure, the weight of your day, you can surrender that to me. How do I do that? How do we find that relationship? Well, why not start with this simple prayer that when prayed from your heart to God's, he's always promised to hear. You can say, Lord, I'd like to reconnect with you. I ask you to forgive me for my sin. I want you to make me into the person that you intended me to be all along. I'm inviting you to be my leader and my Lord. Thank you for hearing my prayer today. And if you've prayed that prayer, write to me, please. Prayer at theperspective.tv. I have some literature that I'll send you to help you in your journey with God or call us anytime at the number on the screen. Thanks for listening today to The Perspective.